autism adult uh, disorder. And specifically here I'm talking about Alzheimer's disease dementia. Um, and so hopefully by the end of this talk you'll know a bit more about why we're studying babies with Down syndrome to understand more about an adult disorder. Um, I should probably mention that um, I work as part of the Long Downs Research Consortium, which is a group of five sites spread across UCL, Birkbeck, Queen Mary, and the National Institute for Medical Research. And we're all trying to understand more about the development of Alzheimer's and Down syndrome. So we have teams at UCL working on genetics, um, as well as um, mouse models of Down syndrome. And there are also, there's a team up here that works with babies with Down syndrome. Queen Mary do a lot of the blood work, so they're uh, doing lots of induced pluripotent stem cell research to understand more about um, Down syndrome and Alzheimer's. And then the NIMR um, is really focusing on mouth models as well. So again, why are we studying infants to understand uh, Alzheimer's? Well, we believe at our lab that the only real way to understand an endpoint of development is to really track its progression uh, right from the start. So what about cognition and behavior is different in children with Down syndrome? And what about the individual differences that a lot of children have when they're growing up? And we know that Down syndrome is caused by an extra copy of chromosome 21. And there's a gene on chromosome 21 called the APP gene. And this is a protein coding gene and because children with Down syndrome have this extra chromosome and therefore this extra expression of this gene right from birth, even before they're born actually in the womb, we know that this APP gene is overexpressed all the way throughout development. And so it's likely to have a significant impact on brain development as they're growing up. And so the, the overall aim of the project is to try and understand more about the individual differences of children with Down syndrome, really to understand uh, and establish subgroups in the population, um, perhaps that might help us to identify the early risk markers and the early protective markers um, of, of something like Alzheimer's disease in Down syndrome. I should mention that the APP gene that's overexpressed it leads to the uh, deposits of plaques and tangles in the brain. So the overexpression of this gene leads to plaques and tangles being deposited in the brain. And we know that these plaques and tangles are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. And so that's why the overexpression is really important to understand um, the development of these plaques and tangles in, in a population such as children with Down syndrome who are at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's. And so a lot of the methods we use at the lab focus on things like eye tracking, uh, which involves measuring where the infant looks at the screen, uh, when, we present, <coughs> like, when we present visually um, attention-demanding tasks, things that try and understand more about memory, and also EEG and ERP, which are these kind of caps here, which measure the um, surface brain potential um, of babies when they do things like look at screens that, and, and do memory tasks, looking at quite dynamic stimuli, um, we also use something called actigraphy, which is essentially just a watch that an infant can wear for seven days that measures its sleep and wake cycles. Um, and so it gives us an understanding about things like sleep fragmentation and how this impacts memory. And also we, we measure environmental factors and usually this involves seeing how the infant interacts with its mother or its father um, in controlled environment, so when they come into the lab, we give them a set of toys and just see what the environment's like. It's also including things like measuring social economic status um, and various dimensions along demographics and things like that. So EEG and ERP, why are we using that? Well, one of the reasons is because it's very easy to administer to babies um, and it doesn't require the babies to make an overt response or give us any form of um, sign to say that they've recognized the stimulus or anything like that. We can essentially put this, uh, the cap onto a baby's head and measure what sorts of brain potentials we see when they're doing tasks like memory tasks. We can also look at um, the brain's resting state potential. So when there is nothing um, happening, maybe when they're, when they're resting, hopefully, um, they sit still enough for us to get some meaningful data. 
Um, and we can do things like record event-related potentials, which are when we time lock the event uh, or some stimulus to the brain's activity, and then we average over time to see um, what brain response we get when the infant's watching some sort of stimulus. And perhaps most importantly, it's to understand more about what's happening beneath just the behavioral response. So sometimes we see um, people and groups of people with developmental disorders give us the same behavioral response. So they will recognize the same number of uh, words in a list. But when you look at their underlying neuro neurophysiology, it's very different. For example, when you give individuals with autism spectrum disorder a simple task of trying to remember a list of words, they will recognize a same, the same number of words from the list as a typically developing um, group of people as well. However, if we, <coughs> if we expect this to be the typical response, where the red indicates some um, neural activity, it's a positive going ERP, or positive uh, neural activity compared to new words, um, kids with um, autism spectrum disorder show much shorter lasting effects and, and in a typical time window of 800 to 1500 milliseconds where you would expect to see the response in typically developing individuals, you don't actually see the response in individuals with ASD. But you wouldn't know this just by their neuro, uh, just by their behavioral responses. You really need to measure ERP to understand this difference. And sleep can tell us a lot about things like memory and how much uh, disruption of sleep um, impacts things like memory. And we know that sleep actually is, um, sleep differs across the 24-hour um, cycle in people with Alzheimer's disease. So just before people with Alzheimer's disease go on to receive their diagnosis, they often report changes in their sleep patterns. And so what we're trying to, trying to do is, because we're trying to understand an early risk marker of Alzheimer's disease, we really want to measure sleep before in, in infancy and see whether this is different in um, children to understand more about how, how can we predict the onset of Alzheimer's in our group. Um, And we know that sleep patterns in Down syndrome are also very different to sleep patterns in, say, or, um, autism spectrum disorder and Williams syndrome. They show much more fragmentation of their sleep. And so this is one of our areas of focus in our, in our research. So some of our earliest findings in our um, study so far, we've seen about 80 babies uh, with Down syndrome. And I'm presenting data from just 50 of those today. Um, and this is all quite early research, we're in the second year of our, second and a bit year of our five year grant. So this is just one task using the eye checker that we present. Um, and this task involves a presentation of a stimulus in the center of the screen. And then in some trials, this stimulus at the center of the screen disappears, and then another stimulus at the side appears. And we call this the gap condition because the central stimulus disappears. However, in another condition of the experiment, the central stimulus remains on screen when the stimulus at the periphery appears. And so there's two competing stimuli on the screen. And we call this the overlap condition because the two stimuli are competing. And you can imagine for a baby, it's very hard to disengage from some central stimulus that they've been focusing on and to then move their attention across. And so we use this as a, me as a measure of disengagement. However, here, where the central stimulus disappears, you could think about it as the infant being facilitated. So they're given some sort of cue, oh, this one's gone, so now where's the next one going to be? So it's a facilitation effect. And so this is what we see when we plot uh, the individual scores. From, so each one of these points represents a different baby. Um, and we see lots of individual differences, which is, as I mentioned at the start, something that we're quite interested in, because we, we want to track these individual differences. <coughs> If we take these individual differences here and we correlate them with some of our um, behavior measures, we can understand more about what, what is this disengagement cost and what is, it, what is it linked to in terms of behavior. So that's what I did here. Um, so as we can see that disengagement, or the, the longer it takes you to disengage, is linked to the number of words that babies produced 
and understood, and it's, it's a negative association. So the, the fewer words that babies understood and produced, the longer it took them to disengage. So here we're looking at things like memory and, um, sorry, disengagement and language. Um, in addition, um, this disengagement cost uh, was also positively linked to aggression. So this doesn't mean that we're dealing with a whole bunch of aggressive babies. Um, but what it does mean is that the higher scores, in, uh, the higher the baby infant or baby scored on, on measures on one of our questionnaires called the CBCL, which is the Child Behaviour Checklist, um, the longer it took them to disengage. And the measures were things like um, easily frustrated, or um, has angry moods, is quite stubborn or temperamental. But then if we go back to this graph, what do the individual differences over here tell us? Well, um, individual differences in, this, differences in facilitation were positively linked to, um, were positively associated to, to attention. Um, and also, um, impulsivity. So the more that babies were attending to the screen, the more that they showed this facilitation response, which kind of makes sense. Um, they're looking at the screen, they're paying more attention, they're more facilitated. But what's interesting is this impulsivity relationship. So um, it's a positive correlation, suggesting that babies who were facilitated were also more impulsive. In one of our tasks, we call this the object memory task, because we present in infants with this screen here, and we familiarize them with this screen, and then later on, we present a different screen, which looks like this. And as you can see, everything stayed the same, but there's this pineapple. And usually, um, infants will look more towards novelty when they detect it. So if we see increased looking times towards this pineapple, then we make some inferences about the infant recognizing the change and therefore having some sort of memory for the original um, study condition. And when we look at group data, so when we compare um, children with Down syndrome to typically developing children, just on the overall proportion looking time to the pineapple, we see quite similar, quite similar um, overall proportion looking time. There's no significant difference between the blue bars or the green bars. But as I mentioned before, we're interested in individual differences, so let's go ahead and plot these with some of our variables that we think might be correlated to them. <clears throat> and one of our hypotheses was that increased looking times might be related to measures of baby IQ. And we have a um, measure of baby IQ, or a proxy for baby IQ, um, called the Mullen Early Learning Scales. And one of the, me one of the domains of this, um, this scale is fine motor skill. And so if we look at what fine motor skill is related to, um, so fine motor skill is related to um, novel object recognition in our sample. In another task, it's very similar to the first one, we do exactly the same thing. We present some stimuli to the infant on four different locations of the screen, but this time we flip two of the objects. So it's a bit, of, it's a bit harder, this task. <clears throat> so as you can see here, on the right side of the screen, these two, this lizard and hedgehog, have flipped. <coughs> and again, we don't see any differences between groups when we plot overall looking time as a proportion. <clears throat> but what we do see are that detection of the novelty in, in the flip um, is also linked negatively um, to attentiveness to joint activity. And these scores, um, these actual measures, are what we, how we collect those data are we ask parents to come to the lab and we videotape an eight minute session of them playing with their infant and we measure the, the, um, the interaction on various domains such as joint activity, attentiveness to parent, and the dyad between the mother and, or the father and the infant. Um, so what we can see is that looking to the novel flip is actually, if you looked towards, if you didn't look towards the novelty, you actually showed lower scores, the baby showed lo lower scores of joint activity, um, and also they were less attended to their parent. When we look at things like sleep, 
um, and this is using the watch that I mentioned at the start, so sleep-wake cycles. Um, we also see that looking to novelty um, was, a, was positively associated with more sleep. So if our infants slept 85% of the night, they were more likely to look and detect the novelty. And this is kind of an overall thing from everything that I presented today, is, is whether or not infants with Down syndrome just need more time to understand and encode the stimuli that we present to them. So in a lot of our tasks, what we do is we block the design. So we present some trials for the individual to study, and then we test. And then we present them again with some more study um, material, and then we test. And this is what we call a block design. But if there was a problem with encoding the stimuli in the first place, we wouldn't necessarily see the effects that we see here right at the start, but we see them right at the end. Because it just takes the infant longer time to understand what's happening. And we observe this in a lot of our trials. So for example, um, the first trial, it looks very different to performance on the second trial or block. So for example, um, these are the four locations on the screen. So we have the left bottom, the right top, the right bottom, and the left bottom. And remember the pineapple was in, this is a different trial, but suppose the pineapple, well it was in this trial, in the left bottom of the screen, we see increased looking times towards that area. We see it both for typically developing and children with Down syndrome. But if you look at the blue line, which is just the children with Down syndrome, you can see that their performance on the first trial is much more variable. However, children with typically developing children show much more <coughs> increased response, uh, to increased looking time to the pineapple. By the second trial, the, the performance of children with Down syndrome is looking much more similar to typ typically developing children. Um, so it's suggesting some sort of block effect. And we see similar things for the, the location flip. So here, again, the blue line is children with Down syndrome. And I should mention that the area of the flip was the right. So it's, the, it's these two middle points. So children with Down syndrome have much more, children, typically developing children, have much more looking time towards the right of the screen, whereas infants with Down syndrome are much more variable. However, by the third trial here, we see much more looking time to the left of the screen, which is what you'd expect because this time the flip was on the left. Um, and so I, this is children with Down syndrome, showing the pattern that we would expect, and then this is children without Down syndrome, typically developing children, again looking towards the left. So it's a question of whether or not infants with Down syndrome may just take long, longer to familiarise or habituate with the information that we present to them to encode. And this is important because in a lot of our studies we use familiarization, we present uh, stimuli a number of times and we expect that the child will have encoded the stimuli by the third presentation. However, this might be a wrong assumption. If it was habituation, for example, if we present the information to the child and, and just until they got bored of it, it might, be more, um, it might be more useful in determining whether or not they actually encoded the stimuli. So this is one way that we can move our research forward. But of course, we still have lots more to do. We have lots more data to collect, like I mentioned at the start. We aim to collect data from about 150 babies with Down syndrome and about 50 babies without Down syndrome or typically developing children. Um, and we still have lots of EEG and ERP data to analyze. As you, as you can see, I haven't presented any of those data. Um, and we're hoping that we will be able to identify some early risk markers of Alzheimer's disease in this population of children with Down syndrome in order to not only inform the development of Alzheimer's and Down syndrome, but to able to understand Alzheimer's generally across all population. The reason that this is an interesting subgroup to use is because we know that there are much more increased risk to develop Alzheimer's. And also what's interesting is we have a team at UCL have, uh, who have done very similar tasks to us, but with an adult group of people with Down syndrome who are at the, at the age that they're starting to, to develop Alzheimer's. So what we hope is that some of our individual differences in our measures might map on to the individual differences in the adult stream and we'll be able to tie the two later together um, in order to understand more about this.
40 of our babies longitudinally. And because we're interested in the extremes, um, we're planning to do a first round of analysis on our data and then find who are the babies that we're affectionately terming calling the high flyers. Um, who are the high flyers and <coughs> can we track those longitudinally? So yeah, we will be doing longitudinal longitudinal analysis, assuming that um, you know, we're able to get, get it done fast enough so that we've got enough time within our five years. But we hope to see them three times. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank each of you once again.